moment of life. I feel that more understanding of why it is that most merciful God either gives or condemns us to 80 odd years in this life to, because it takes, you know, it takes, it takes time, doesn't it? Much time and practice. If it's a preparatory school, which I suspect it is, this life, then how can one hasten the process? The lessons have to be learnt one by one, don't they? We learn by mistakes and How can a, a little child suddenly jump into high school? It just doesn't work, does it? We're not prepared. So maybe that's how it is for us. We have to step by step eliminate or face the uh, limitations of this mortal existence and gradually uh, find a way through. I can't give you a definite answer, my dear. All I can say is this is how it seems to me. And part of this is, is the process of sitting to meditate and f at least appearing to spend the whole time thinking. I remember being told about dreaming at night, how people that research these things now say that you only dream when you actually descending down into sleep and coming up out of it. You go through this sort of layer of consciousness we call thinking, dreaming. And nobody really knows what happens in between. You know, countless people, if you ask them how they slept, they'll say, I spent the whole time thinking. In fact, someone said to me, just, I uh, can't remember, today or yesterday, how did you sleep? I only slept for 20 minutes or something, she said. Well, how did she know? <laughs> <laughs> how, who knows how long we've actually slept in between the dreams. And so it is when we spend the whole meditation period, or we say we spent the whole meditation period thinking. Did we? Or was it just a few minutes at the beginning of meditation and the end of it? What happened in between? We don't know, do we? You see, it's so important to recognize that we don't actually know what happens when we meditate. We, we can talk endlessly about the beginnings and the end of it, the practice, but real meditation, which is, so they say, union, who can describe it? If you don't know what I'm talking about, just be present. That's right. Here yeah, now, feel this presence. This one invisible, silent reality that's holding us. This spiritual starlight, as it were. Now, we cannot either divide it or describe it. It's beyond words, isn't it? And yet this entire building with people downstairs, the street outside, Bakewell, where does it end? Extend it to your own home. The journey here, it contains everything, doesn't it? In this undivided unity. Well, when we meditate, we may or may not get a glimpse of it. Who knows? It may happen subconsciously or higher, from higher consciousness. Either way, you can't describe it.
It said that meditation is very similar to falling asleep. You don't know how you fall asleep. Nobody does. Nobody's experienced falling asleep. How does it happen? Similarly, meditation is like falling awake. How does it happen? And yet just sitting in this awakeness, this higher reality, which we can't describe, we're comfortable in it, aren't we? We're at peace. And we may even feel we're loved. Certainly there's no criticism, is there? No judgment of us. Why do we continue to meditate? Most of us are practicing, some still a bit irregularly, but most of us are doing it to some extent, most, most days. What is it that impels us to do it? <laughs> yes, I used to be able to put it into words. I could speak for hours about it, and I'm not so sure now what it is. <laughs> it sort of goes, goes a bit beyond my knowing, my ability to describe it. Again, we see it from our point of view, don't we? It is lost. <laughs> it is, whereas the fact is that we are lost. It is ever present, isn't it? <laughs> But we, we are the lost ones. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. But dears, with us, it's, it's been quite an effort for all of us from from far and wide to gather together this morning. You know, what's, what's made it happen? It's because you've all been working and practicing at least sufficiently to provide the energy and the motivation to meet together to, to consider this. Maybe it's only just by considering our life, how our life has changed since we first became interested in this work, to, to see that actually something does happen. Who, who can, who's ever seen the grass grow? Or a tree grow? And yet, if you go away, come back, a few months later you can see it's grown. Imperceptibly, the trees get bigger year by year, don't they? And perhaps we get more confident in this. Maybe so, dear. I, I can't say I actually feel vibrations, but they may be so, the subtle ones. I know people say it's all like that. It's all in waves, isn't it? So maybe this is why we have good days and bad days and we call good meditations and not so good. Maybe it's all to do with these small scale or big scale vibrations. Up and down, good and bad, at least in this world of what we call duality. Because this presence, of course, is unchanging, isn't it? That's the contrast between this world that changes, which is called duality, and this world, 
it isn't really another world, it's what's called the third point, the Trinity. There's this and there's this, you see. And if we miss this third point, then we get confused, we get into the realm of questioning and doubting. You gave me a beautiful answer this morning, walking down from the church, Daniela. I said, I think, as far as I remember, why do you come? And uh, you answered, do you remember what you answered? Um, I think you said something about um, allowance, you see. You said something about um, this space which just allowed you to be. Yes. It gave you the space to, as it were, relax and mm. and that sort of took the stress out. When you arrived the day before yesterday you were quite knotted up, weren't you? You, you? you were carrying a real burden with you and now you see you've let it go, haven't you, largely. Mm. You're feeling much better. It shows in your face, in your body language and everything about you your eyes. You don't quite realise how it's happened. How, how can you ex we explain what's happened? But it's just like I was looking at the stars, you see, this morning. I looked at the stars and I was just taken out of my little world of me and my problems. Just sort of given the space to... So perhaps the only thing I've done that makes, puts me in this position, I've just... I won't say I've done it, I think. By the mercy of God, I'm dying out of what didn't make it possible. But I was so anxious to help you, or, or <laughs> be or do something, that I kept getting in the way. Something like that. Or just prolonged meditation, which is just that, isn't it? Far and away the most consistent teacher I've ever had in my life is nature. It's the sky, dear. The grass and the trees and the birds. Yes, I've read a few lives of few saints, but The first saint that came into my life was um, was one called Saint Cuthbert, who lived in the north of England. A place called Lindisfarne. It's sort of an island just off the coast of Northumberland, and I went. I'd never heard of him when I first went up there. But there was a small little island just offshore and when the tide was out you could walk out there. And I went out there and uh, there were a few bits of plastic around, I picked them up. I suddenly found myself crying. I didn't know why. Extraordinary really. But I was very deeply moved by it. And uh, later on, after I, I, I read about this man, this was uh, going back a long time, uh, I don't know, 12 or 1300, long time ago. A um, man called Cuthbert, who used to go to this island and pray there. And later on, he became a, on another island, became a hermit, and died there. And uh, I always felt uh, he became one of my first sort of spiritual friends. I felt <laughs> there was a connection. 
Um, but I felt there was what God knows. One of the things I loved about him was, first of all, he started life as a shepherd, so did I, <laughs> and uh, was a man of the hills, and, uh, and he was asked to go into the church and be a bishop, but he preferred to be a hermit, so re re refused, and uh, well, he was for a year or two and then gave it up. Obviously, he felt there was more, he could be more useful, could serve better in, in silent prayer than by being a a worldly figure, an administrator of the church. But uh, I've not felt particularly close to any saint really since then. I've, I've read quite a number of lives and have been touched by a few for a few days, but... I was first drawn to Ramana Maharshi because I I saw a picture of him with his arm around a cow, and because I also love cows, I thought, oh, there's a man I, 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 after my own heart. <laughs> he loved cows and he didn't speak very much, <laughs> so I like that. <laughs> but, um, no, I haven't made much of change, really, or those who, who wrote many books. I've read quite a number of, or dipped into rather than read carefully, a number of spiritual books, but I don't read much now at all. I was well taught the Bible as a child. I like to quote from the Bible, you can see it, they quite often refer to it, but um, no nature dear, I keep coming back to, the, to nature, to the sky and the stars. I really love grass, I do, I, I find I was, went for a little walk yesterday, I was with someone it came out, just we'd been on the road, came onto grass, I just stood there and I thought, I always feel comfortable when I'm looking at grass. It's as though my sort of unfailing friend is with me. Cows eat grass, do not hmm? Cows eat grass. Cows like grass, so do I. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I remember there was one funny occasion as a young man, I was so in love with grass that but in the spring, when the grass is so young and tender, I remember putting my head down and eating grass. It made me... <laughs> it wasn't as nice as I thought, actually, when I tried. Yes, there is a stage. I remember I was, when I was at, attending the school of meditation, where I learned we were a, we were encouraged to do make spiritual reading a part of every day. Well, I tried. Yes, I think I did that. It was I used to read a bit of the Bible every day for a few years. Mm -hmm. Yes, I wouldn't say I haven't learnt a lot. They've rather gone out of fashion in the West. But, um, yes, I learnt a lot when I was living in Russia. And they make a lot of saints, a lot, they pay a lot of attention to saints. And they've got countless, almost every village has its own saint or holy man. And, uh, yes, you, you go from one to another, really, as you go around the country. And they're all very interesting. They're all people just like you and me, you know. They all had... It, it's just to learn about their lives is very encouraging and instructive, really, I've found. And there's a saint for every possible type of person and every possible type of condition, you know, <laughs> what they've had to deal with in life. So I think, so it's very common. In, if, in fact, it's a part of every Russian home. Um, you tend to collect little postcards of the local saint as you live your life. They're rather like family family photographs, and there's a little corner in the living room where you put these little icons. Yes, they're like a like family photographs, really. You, you become part of your spiritual family, the, the people who 
travelled a similar path to yourself, it's very comforting. Think of how they've struggled. Most of them have had, some have had very difficult lives, just like, just like we have. So if you find a well-documented life of a saint, it's worth reading it. <laughs>